Welcome to Re-Review, where we watch movies from our past with a perspective from today. Your hosts are Matt, Bobby, and Austin, and we love the films from our youth, so we're taking a look back to see if they still hold up. On this episode, we're discussing The Matrix, released in 1999, directed by Lana and Lily Wachowski, starring Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne, Carrie Ann Moss, and Hugo Weaving. This movie begs you to ask, what is real? Now, this is a fair warning. We're spoiling a 24-year-old movie, so if you haven't seen it, we will be revealing key plot points. Can we just time travel a little bit here? Can we go back to the the burgeoning beautiful world that was 1999? Oh, wasn't life great then? You were hanging around. You heard about some movie that was coming out that everyone's interested in called The Matrix. What was your experience seeing this for the first time? You know, now that I'm thinking about it, like, I don't know what got me into the theater because I don't know if I even watched the trailer for this. Like, I'm, I might not have seen it until like a little bit after its initial run when everyone had kind of already said that it was amazing. Cause I, I, I watched the trailer after mm-hmm. watching it like some, you know, a while back. Like, I don't remember this at all. Like I, 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 like you wouldn't know what to make of it. Like they were very mm-hmm. cryptic in their marketing mm-hmm. about what it was supposed mm-hmm. to be. Uh, I, I think one of the things that they kept uh, promoting was the bullet time thing, and they were dropping yeah, that term right. bullet time, and you're like, "Look, it's bullet time!" <laughs> like, and they they didn't really want to describe it or anything, and you know, they're being cryptic, and I, you know, even even if you ask somebody to describe it. Like what what was Morpheus says, like no one can be told what the matrix is. You can only see it. I feel like that describes the mate, like the movie, the matrix perfectly. (laughs) Like it's, it's hard to summarize and get somebody on board. Like I can only imagine going to, you know, somebody who didn't already have kind of like an open mindset to movies like this and try to explain Mm -hmm. it. Like I can't imagine explaining this to like, you know, uh, you know, Ebert. You know, to just to critics thumbs like that. up and yeah. that's it. Yeah, <laughs> just go watch it. I can't tell you about what's going on in this film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because I'm seeing and maybe I have this wrong here. It says it was released in March of '99. That's uh, seems surprisingly early in the uh, early in the year, right? And I don't know if the lead up, I, I, everything you're describing almost feels like it makes sense. Like there was just a beat of this movie was out and then you heard about the buzz because this was, I mean, the internet was there, but it wasn't in the same way. And you, the people you knew were talking about it and it's just like, wait, maybe I do need to go see this. Bobby, mm-hmm. what was your first time like watching the movie? Oh, I vividly remember watching this in the theaters and just being completely shocked by I wasn't expecting what it was, didn't really know what to expect. But I remember having this experience, which is super rare for me in theaters, that I completely forgot that I was in a movie theater. Like I was just so engaged in the story that like I like I was just like, wow, what's gonna happen next? Like kind of like the edge of your seat kind of experience that everybody talks about, but like mm-hmm. it actually like rarely ever happens. And I think it was like I think I remember being knocked out of that experience like halfway through the movie when they when they got to the part where it's just a completely white blank screen and like mm. somebody coughed and I was like, Oh wait, oh yeah, I'm actually in a movie theater watching a movie right now. Like I was just like so absorbed in this thing that was just so new and so interesting to me that I was just like, it kind of like threw me for a loop to have like such a brand new experience. And then I'll take you back in the way back machine once again, when the movie actually came out on home video and the days Mm -hmm. of physical media, like it was no longer VHS and it was a brand new, like, I remember watching, this was one of the first blue or or no, one of the first DVDs, Blu-ray wasn't out yet. One of the first DVDs that I saw where it was just like surround sound. And like, it was one of the first home theater experiences I had. Mm -hmm. Now you're getting into the start of the, let's have you rebuy the same movie over and over and over and over. Right. And I uh, listen, we probably all own the matrix on many different formats, sadly, over the years that is just like, well, 
Did they put it in VHS? Oh, no. I have the DVD, but now it's the Blu-ray. I got to get the Blu-ray. Well, now they got the 4K UHD Blu-ray, so I got to get the 4K (laughs) UHD Blu-ray. And what have we lost over the years as a result of this? Do you remember when DVDs first started? And yes, we're totally going waxing for the nostalgia right now. There would be so much content, extra content. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The director like- commentary, interviews with the actors, all the behind the scenes stuff. And you could just drill down and learn so much about how they made a film. Yeah. There and it's were- all gone now. And there sucks. were so many DVDs that were basically like film school in a box. Oh, no. Like, that was, I still, right now, underneath my TV, I have that DVD box set. Even though I have the Blu-rays and everything else that came out since then, I pull it out because it has so many discs. I think it's the one that came with the Animatrix as well. Mm-hmm. And it had like just dedicated to just the behind the scenes. Unfortunately, they didn't get a lot of stuff for the original Matrix behind the scenes. But when they came around for the sequels, they did this whole thing from literally beginning to when they were doing the training in a warehouse all the way through. So you got to like literally like go along the process of the physical costuming and the props and everything. And yeah, you're right. That like, it's very rare to see that level of dedication to the behind the scenes stuff that you can really get in these kind of movies. And is it maybe it's not that they're not doing it today, right? Cause they do do it. It's just, they don't put it out. Maybe it's a cost thing. Because we there, know filmmakers not, still care about their product and their craft. They want to track all this stuff because you want to document it, right? There's just, there's just not nearly as, as much stuff these days. Like now there might be like a behind the scenes documentary, but a lot of it is marketing. You know, like a lot of it is the actors talking about like how much fun it was to work on the movie. But there are some documentaries that came with DVDs and Blu-rays that are basically just like teaching you how to make movies, essentially. They're just amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you get into the marketing, right? So we could kind of come back to the bullet time. And and I will say, my, my experience the first time was definitely, I was absolutely wowed. And I immediately said, I need to watch this movie again. And if we, I haven't kept a tally, but probably for all of us, we've probably seen this movie too much in the in the case of what how most people watch movies. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've, this I've is seen a, this movie, like, it probably wouldn't be an exaggeration, say, like, a hundred times. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that it gets played quite often even to even to the point where it's like we know it so well that i don't mind treating it as a background movie sometimes mm-hmm. or it could be one that i'm watching you know with with full intent it just it just is one of those things bullet time that really was a big deal and and i think about it in terms of a uh, when did max payne come out that video game where they like basically <laughs> stole that idea so you could run around and throw yourself into bullet time while you're shooting people it was just such a um really 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 cool thing to see on screen when all they were doing was just really shifting a perspective well but it just, felt amazing just the mechanism for how they did it like they yeah, all the cameras the, yeah having yeah. just a like a like a whole set of still cameras set up on rigs and mm-hmm. like i remember the behind the scenes again great behind the scenes they're talking about how like originally they were talking about like strapping rockets to film cameras to try to get them to <laughs> right. go fast enough so that you can right. get those shots. And then uh, yeah. the visual effects guy who's in charge or whatever, is just like, Oh, you know what? Well, it's video. It's a whole bunch of still images. Let's just do right. that. And we'll write a program to fill in the gaps. Yeah. That's such a brilliant idea because if you got a camera going really, really fast, you have to think about the motion blur. And so in order to freeze that motion blur, You'd have to just add just a huge amount of light. No, it's such a brilliant idea to just have a whole bunch of cameras instead of one that move really, really fast. I think it cleaned up a lot of the mechanism of it. And to be fair, they never overused it. I can only think there's only what? Trinity kick scene. There's the the dodge the bullets um, Mm -hmm. with Neo. Uh, There's the double gun. And I think... I think that was it. I don't think they use it again after that. Did they do it when they're fighting in the dojo for a quick second at any point? I I don't. May, look at it. Look at our I, memories failing us, and we love this movie. May, maybe well, when he does well, the jump kick, maybe. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Oh for a yeah. Well, well, they they used a whole lot of different techniques. They did the whole like like cartoon smearing wipe or you see like a whole bunch of arms when it's supposed to be like the punching really fast. And, Mm -hmm. you know, like there was a shot when Trinity jumped from building to building and that was kind of a, 
slow motion. It wasn't quite like a bullet time, but it was something like kind of like some kind of slow motion crane. So there was just a lot of really neat tricks in this. Which uh, I think is the part that's really cool in terms of just geeking out on the tech. And because we did have access to get the information on what they were doing, Mm -hmm. which made it all the more fascinating of how they put, you know, this film together at the end of the day. But now we can talk, we can talk story. We can talk. I think the core thing that, that really begs why I think this movie still absolutely stands up today in terms of just being pulled into a world that is not your own. That just tickles at the back of your head. Anytime you've ever questioned anything. The Wait, glitches. something feels off about this. And it really just goes full bore into the idea that, well, yeah, it feels off because it is off. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, that just, thinking back to that first time going, yes, I knew the world was wrong. I'm also plugged into this machine right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, did you, did after watching this movie, did you start questioning reality at all? Like, did you did you ever see something like uh, uh, the deja vu and start kind of wondering? Well, the problem has always been after this movie, any occurrences to deja vu prior to, I was just like, oh, that's weird. But now I can't help but think about a black cat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, oh, I'm in the Matrix. It's okay. I just oh, move no, on from it. Still, resetting though. the Matrix now. Uh, I think that <laughs> so, between this one and the Truman Show, like, really started to make me question – they're like, shit, am, am, am I in a virtual reality TV show? And I'm, I don't like, I'm not aware of it. Like, are you guys actors? Do I, are you agents? Do I need to like it? You know, I remember thinking about it and it actually, and like most movies that are good, it made you think afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, now I think that some people took it a little bit too, to the extreme, I, you know, you, you, it's almost a verb now, red pilling and blue pilling, right? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Sure. So I think that there's an aspect of it that I think people take too far, but you know, it's, it's an interesting, uh, you know, mind game you can play just kind of playing it out to, you know, like I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I would love if you could just download stuff into my brain and I could instantly oh, know kung fu right. or every language or how to do anything at any time. Right, would be amazing. Yeah, that's that's totally a dream. Yes, it feels odd to say that. I feel like we can get there one day, <laughs> but it's also terrifying at the same time. <laughs> the thought that we could take that level of control because we're just dealing with electrical, you know, zaps and. Your brain is just data storage at the end yeah, of the day. All, all you need is a hole in the back of your head to get okay, like a giant right, that's a plug different, that's a jammed <laughs> in the back of it. <laughs> Chat GPT <laughs> two like two point or something like that. <laughs> oh good lord! It starts thinking for you and writing sentences <laughs> for you, you because you no longer oh, have no. the capability of doing it. Yeah, see, we're going down the path, and that's good. This is what the movie challenges you. Oh to crap! Think is about. this the beginning of the the AI? Because like that yes. was the whole that was the dawn of the AI was Chat GPT is our <laughs> is our our beginning of the well what did they say like it, it was in the it was in the beginning of the twenty first century or whatever when Marvel mm-hmm. started to... <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is why the machines shows nineteen ninety nine is the perfect year and they right. were right yes. they're absolutely right <laughs> 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 tell tell me okay you know Trinity we see her kicking ass immediately. Carrie Ann Moss just dominating the screen and, and then coming in. We see Neo, who's like a sheepish hacker nerd. Uh, we get the scene. He's he's selling code as drugs. What was he saying? He was selling code? Like hack, like hacking stuff for people, I think. Or yeah, you didn't, you didn't catch me with this. And, you know, we got the whole follow the white rabbit thing. And, mm-hmm. and how, I mean, as cool as it was, the idea of someone just taking over your computer screen that felt like something that could happen. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and it, it hasn't changed even now. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> like, I'm sure in the middle of this, somebody could probably just totally pop on the screen and start saying stuff or whatever. And, you know, it would, it wouldn't be unusual. Scaringly enough. <laughs> yeah, no. And so they say the matrix has you, um, it, it just, that's the part I think that helped make it feel really real because at this point, when we think of the tech that was in our everyday lives, everyone kind of had that, that PC at home. Um, and 
with your old CRT monitor. So seeing that, you know, black and oh. green. You okay. Love CRTs. Uh, I, I have to I ask you, did you get the Matrix Rain like screensaver for your computer? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. yeah. I didn't get it, but I definitely saw it all over the place. I had to. I had to have it. <laughs> I mean, we don't even have screensavers anymore, but mm-hmm. that was that was a must have back after this movie came out. I had to have the Fallen Code Rain. Well, do some people not know that er- some early computers were actually like a black screen with the green text? I could see that people don't know that anymore. I mean, it still is. You you know, you bring out your brand new MacBook, open up Terminal, and there you go. Yeah. All right. You can put yourself in that world if you want to. Yeah, well, it used to be that was all you had. Mm-hmm. It was all just Terminal, and that was it. C dot dot slash D, D-I-R. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it's been so long, I don't even fully remember everything that we would do in DOS. <laughs> Let's get back to the show here. Keanu Reeves, Neo, our Lord and Savior. <laughs> the path that he goes through, Slander you know, to to Jurassic Park, to being, uh, t- <laughs> to being, you know, that the first initial scene of trying to get him to escape from the office. Still, one of my favorite points where he's on the phone with Morpheus. And and Morpheus is talking to him, and he's like, the agents are here. He looks up, and Neil goes, shit. And Morpheus says, Bobby? Yes. It's the best thing. It's the best thing ever. Because it's just this omission of him being so aware of what's happening in the Matrix, and Neil being so not clued in. And from here, we get our introductions to the agents, to Hugo Weaving as Agent Smith, just controlling Neo to say, hey, you can keep staying in the matrix without telling him that's what was happening Mm -hmm. or we're going to keep you in prison. And we finally get sort of the mystical nature of the world coming in where they silence him Mm -hmm. completely cover his mouth, which is a really uh, disturbing image. It still is to me because it wasn't that it was, um, I'd say the best representation of how they could have done it, but they did in such a way, especially when you see the strands of skin in between. Oh yeah. I was just like, I, I, I always felt like I could feel oh, that no, it's, it's full of body horror. It's a body <laughs> horror genre. Like there's actually a lot of that in this. I think that, I think when he gets kicked into the real world for the first time and him ripping mm. out the tube from his throat and having all those oh, things, yeah, yeah. like see, seeing seeing the metal sticking out of his skin. Oh no, this is body horror movie, man. Yeah. Yes, I had to take a pause there because I feel <laughs> very uncomfortable. Good. Yeah, when he pulls that out of his mouth, and just that it just makes you want to gag. You're like, oh, oh, that was that was completely inside of his body. It <clears throat> again, it's just it's just fantastic. How do you? Uh, what was your relationship working with uh, Agent Smith? How did you feel about him as as the, the movie progressed? Surprisingly terrifying, considering he's just a mm-hmm. dude in sunglasses and a suit. But Hugo right. Weaving sells the crap out of it. He sure does. He's great. I want to do an impression, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to make suffer you through that. Well, it's so funny because like his character for the most part is uh, somewhat monotone mm-hmm. in his delivery, mm-hmm. but it's especially during the interrogation of Morpheus later on, mm-hmm. it, like even just him talking and being open, you know, he takes his glasses off and, you know, it's a strangely human moment for mm-hmm. a program. Mm-hmm. And even in that tone, it's so like intimidating, you know, the way that he presents everything, like just saying, you know, Mr. Anderson, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, it's such an intimidation factor to it. That's it. It's so weird to think about, you know, e- even the other agents, they don't really get any real moments to shine in this in comparison, but Mm -hmm. you know, the opening sequence, I mean, it's very Terminator esque with the agent chasing Trinity on the rooftop. Yeah. Yeah, You know nothing about what the setup of it is, but after that first jump and just the way everything goes down, like you feel like the police officers behind them that were like, wait, what did we just see? Even in the very, very beginning, it's like, wait, who's the good guys and who's the bad guys here? Are we rooting for the cops? Are we rooting for Trinity? Trinity. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Trinity. <laughs> Trinity. 
But it's it's hey, you get that great line. Don't give me that jurist my diction crap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and him going, you know, your your men are already dead, and then we get to cut to the scene of her kicking ass. Yeah, it's fantastic. Let's let's t- put your Morpheus hat on. When did you uh, when did you get convinced that Neo would be the one that they were when they were selling that? Did you have any doubt? When he was on the poster, I guess. <laughs> ah, you know, it's it's a you know it's interesting because I think that they tried to do that uh, switcheroo almost mm-hmm. within the story itself. Um, it, you know, it's very much like anime, right? You know, you very mm. much have the the character drawn into an epic story bigger than themselves, and mm. you know. It, it happens all the time in those kind of stories where they're told that you're yeah. this amazing thing and you don't believe it. And then, you know, it happens. I, I don't know if we're jumping ahead here or not, but I do love the little call. Cause there's so many little call outs in this entire movie, but the, when he's talking to the Oracle mm-hmm. and he's like, you know, you know what I'm going to say. And he, he says for her, I'm not the one. And she's like, I'm sorry, kid. Uh, maybe you're waiting for your next life. Mm-hmm. He gets shot and dies, revives his next life. He is the one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So well, like this is how you know somebody who is paying attention and when in love with the script they're writing, just mm-hmm. writes just this yeah. small little thing, and it's it's just mm, chef's kiss. Right. The, there's a lot the, of that in there. I mean, it just it's just such a compact, well written story. It's I mean, it's. It's one of those where every scene counts and every scene goes to the next scene and even scenes that you think are throwaway or probably related to like the cipher sideline and the story. And then it's just such good storytelling. Then there's those convergences of stories where it's like it's coming to a climax both in the Matrix and in the real world. And Mm -hmm. it's just well done. How'd you feel about the crew? Uh... You know, I kind of forgot about some of them. Yeah, um, I got killed off pretty quickly, some of them. <laughs> well, I, if you asked me some of their names, I remember Mouse. Yes, I, I feel like they, they gave enough characteristics to them. But if you asked me what the short blonde-haired woman's name was or the taller guy. Switch. Switch they and... Po- yeah, see, I, I don't I, remember I remember Tank and Dozer, the brothers. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Cypher, of course. Cypher, man. He's the man. Like what? What of like what a difference in villain type between him and Hugo Weaving? Oh, big time! Yeah, big time. Which begs the question: Okay, you're in Cipher's shoes. What are you doing? Do you think he? Do you understand yeah, I mean, his path? I, I think I think what he wanted to do, like, made sense to me. Like, he's like, screw this! I don't want to be here anymore. I want to be in the Matrix. That makes you don't sense to eat me. Oatmeal or cornmeal or whatever like they're the, eating. Right. I just didn't like the way he went about it, and that's what makes the perfect villain, right? Like he made it makes sense. Like oh, like why didn't I take the what what was it the red pill or the blue pill? The blue pill. Yeah. He's, blue he, pill. Yeah. He's like he's like why didn't I take the blue pill? You know, then that that was perfect to me. That made perfect sense. But I mean, just going about it the wrong way. That's that's a perfect villain. To I mean, his motivation for doing it all, like. It's like, yeah, he do, he wants to eat a steak. He doesn't want to eat that gruel anymore. He wants to live a fine life. He doesn't want to have all that stuff anymore. I think the thing that fake. like makes it all the more interesting when you think about it, and it's something Morpheus says to Neo when he pulled the first night that Neo's in the real world. He apologizes to him and he says, "I'm sorry, Neo. We have a rule. We don't bring people out after a certain age. They usually bring them yeah. out when they're like." kids and teenagers like you see them all those little kids that are in the oracle's mm-hmm. room they have right. these children make decisions about leaving the matrix their families friends and pulling them into this dystopian world where you know they probably don't have much for medicine or anything like that mm-hmm. let alone mm-hmm. decent food or probably you know water that probably doesn't taste weird and they make them make a decision like that like i don't blame them like Especially if you don't see the end of the war, mm-hmm. I I kind of don't blame them. The older you get, the more you you know realize like, okay, this is what I'm giving giving up, and I'm starting to miss my old life, right? And I think that's what they're trying to avoid is like the cipher. So problem. Is the assumption cipher got pulled out a little too late. 
Well, <laughs> something was wrong. You know, he was clearly unhappy with his situation. I think that every time he probably went back into the Matrix, he was just reminded of what he didn't have anymore. Yeah. Mm. And what he didn't Steak. have was Trinity. There's that too. <laughs> Unholy love triangle. <laughs> that was like totally one-sided on his part. Right. <laughs> Therefore, he wanted to kill everyone. Oh, he, yeah. Lord, he, he, pro- like he, pro- he probably saw Neo for the first time. He was like, shit. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, this, I've been I've been here for years. <laughs> we messed up. This this movie should have been in our romance uh, month. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, all about love. Gracious. You know what? A lot of this is all about love. The um <laughs> so he's here to save the world. So much good action. Right, the the way every scene. Think about things. They're running from the agents. He's fighting the agents. I I love the in the building when they do get trapped with the deja vu. Them crawling in between the walls. Oh yeah, that shot. Dust. Yeah, isn't it great? Yeah. It's it's interesting watching this movie from a fighting perspective. Just I mean I'm mean, just trying to think about movies that occurred. Before and after, if you exclude Hong Kong, like the type of fight sequences you got in this movie, you just didn't see. You right. still don't really see fight right. scenes like these nowadays. Well, I, I remember like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I think that came, that was like kind of like the most similar to me. But even that was kind of more like the wire work, like the flowing, like floating mm-hmm. stuff. And like this was even, this was even like more like, grounded than that like more like you know raw than like crouching tiger which was kind of like dancing type of stuff well the fan the fantasy nature of the fights like you said felt down to earth they also felt very real they felt Mm -hmm. guttural they felt like they were truly just beating on each other in the best way possible oh the morpheus versus smith bathroom scene no brutal yeah yeah, brutal fighting Mm mm-hmm even even the train station fight, mm-hmm. and the gun fights were really amazing too. Like the the bank lobby was just an incredible sequence, and the sound design of that was just amazing. Like this was one of the first movies, and of course, like Star Wars with all the Ben Burt stuff was like you know really iconic for sound design. But man, this movie just steps it up another level in terms of sound design. You got to the end there, but we'll kind of roll with it. They're doing the big, the big shebang, trying to save Morpheus, and uh, it, it's it's obviously great, right? Because they just got out of the entirely terrible situation um, to to get back into the Matrix to be like, we're going to pull this off. Neo's going to prove himself to be the one. Like I said, he's on the poster. All right, fine, I give Matt. But <laughs> <laughs> everything they go through that point, the the fight scene in the lobby, the just the amount of debris. That they filmed to just make it look epic is is unreal. The use of the explosion with the elevator to to get him up and the way they they slowed down time there as well to kind of make the the fire look like it was water flowing in a way. Um, the up on the helicopter pad at the top, and then you get the epic most you know the iconic scene of him dodging bullets for the first time. Uh, it, this is me re- sitting here wanting to hit play again right now because all these moments you're just sitting there in awe of of what you're watching and back to the downloading the ship the the helicopter schematics and watching trinity's (laughs) eyes kind of wriggle around because she's getting that knowledge immediately and next thing you know they're fighting and doing doing different stuff it just is so so phenomenal the interview scene with uh, agent smith um and morpheus one of the things that always gets me always always gets me it's you're right he takes off his glasses and he's he's having a very human moment but I always loves he he takes his hands and rubs it over Morpheus's head his sweaty head mm-hmm. and he says i can't even stand the smell of you and sticks his fingers right up in Morpheus's <laughs> nose and every time that scene comes across i'm like oh i could smell the bo just uh, coming through oh, the screen no. I could just smell the sweat and the grime of all the fighting coming through on that scene. I'm like, it is so, so powerful. And you get all the epic shots with the water and, and the big Gatling gun that he's using. It just oh, such, such, such good work. Yes. The, that like, it's such an, it's such an interesting story 
It's interesting to hear a story from a program's point of view. And I think that's just Mm -hmm. why we're always scared of AI and robots is that they'll see humanity probably for what they actually are. When you really Mm -hmm. look at it from a, you know, a bird's eye view and you remove the Mm -hmm. humanity aspect of that point of view, you kind of see it for, you know, you see the spread, you see, you know, the destruction, stuff like that. So what would a program see out of that? You know, no, no peace, no serenity, no, you know, cohabitation with nature or anything Mm -hmm. like that. It's very much. uh, And so you can kind of see the idea that like, you know, you think we're the bad guys, but you know, this, this all, all of this was you, you did all this. You, you destroyed the sun. You did, you know, you destroyed all of this. You started this war Mm -hmm. and like, we're the bad guys. And so he very (laughs) much came from that point of view and having to be stuck in that world. He's stuck in, you know, the nineties with all these people, (laughs) you know, which very much I would love to talk about the idea. Like, do you think they just keep resetting the same 1999 year in the matrix or like, do they get to like 2000? It goes back to like the fifties or something. Hmm. it's it's some weird way of having like a perpetual 1999 but it's like people keep going to work and they don't realize that they're not necessarily progressing in their career or doing anything different so real what it's like oh hey it's january no. again. <laughs> like oh crap it's been a year <laughs> <laughs> oh no is that what's yeah, happening I, to me I... well i mean okay we'll have to mention it even though we're talking about the first one Apparently the matrix does get reset, Matt. (laughs) (laughs) No, you don't accept that. I, I'll, did they make more? I I don't remember. They didn't, (laughs) there was only one, right? One in an animated series. There weren't multiple movies. I mean, (laughs) trying trying to remember. I think that kind of brings the idea of, you know, getting to the end of this movie. Like I, can you, can you see the sequels in the end of this movie? Like, I think there's always going to be a hype by the end of a movie making you want to see more, but I feel seeing the end of this movie feeling like it's such a definitive good end that I didn't think that they really necessary. Like I, I remember watching the, the MTV movie awards yeah. And <laughs> uh, Joel, producer, going up on stage and accepting the award for I I think it got best movie or of the year or something, and him saying like if you love this movie just wait until you see the sequels. That was the first mention of the sequels ever, and mm-hmm. everyone just mm-hmm. lost it. And not sequel, right. sequels mm-hmm. lost right. their mind. And they talk about in the behind the scenes that it was always the plan there was going to be three. But when you really right. watch these, the end of this one and the other ones, like it just didn't feel that way. Like it didn't feel like it flowed. Like this one was like, mm, exclamation there's mark end. Yeah, there's something to be said about the idea of creating something and being happy with the result as is, and stopping where people may want you to do more, and it's okay to stop there. So let me ask you this. I know there's a lot of money involved. So (laughs) do you think that they actually had like a three story structure in mind when they started? Or do you think they said they did? They, according, according to Joel, when they approached him, their opening line was like, we have a great idea for a trilogy. And he was like, that's great. Let's do the first one and go from there. That's mm-hmm. they've stuck to that story after all this time, but it just does not feel that way. When I look at the quality of this movie and what we got in the sequels, it I don't know if it's just that that they they were the underdogs in the first one and then had all mm-hmm. all the money and all the resources for the next two and it just didn't work out the same way. I don't know. I feel like it almost sounds like TV when a TV does a pilot. They get just enough money to get that first one out and going. And then whether or not it's going to be picked up for the rest. So you do what you can, hoping that you'll be able to write more, but you never really fully flesh out all the details until it's time. And then, you know, you get you get the sequels that Bobby doesn't know about. They don't well, There's definitely not a fourth one. Definitely no. not a fourth one. <laughs> I mean, I hear something about an animated movie, but I don't know anything else. 
That one was that one was good. Like if nothing else for the the Renaissance part one and part two. Like I I actually think that tied really well. Like didn't they they also had like a video game they that tied into the movies game, yep. as well like where they they co-shot. Oh, right, right. I think I remember playing that, yeah. So that's kudos to them for that kind of I mean and the directors were in charge of that. Mm-hmm. They were doing that as well during the same time. I mean, I can only imagine how much hair loss would occur if I had to manage, you know, two movies and video games at the same time. Like yeah, video games are hard. extra hard to I, try to right. tie in. Are we being are we being too mean time for a movie. on them? Well, all that considered how much stuff they had to handle. I mean, I guess the fact that it was a somewhat competent movie, but yeah, it's it, it doesn't feel like the same, <laughs> does it? Like it I think it was the grit. It didn't feel gritty. Mm-hmm. For those mm-hmm. other two, whereas this one, mm-hmm. it just exudes grit and you know texture. You you bring up a good point. There's merits like the car chase scenes and stuff like that. So he remembers them. <laughs> he remembers <laughs> they exist. I I, re- I release my shade and apologize for my uh, <laughs> flippant nature. <clears throat> no, it's fine. I think I think you know, listener, you can hear we. This is one of those films that <clears throat> a big effect day one. And again, doing our re-review here many, many years later, I think it's a film that I happily go back to without issue. Um, understanding that the the sense of awe in its fullness may not be there, but I still love everything that, that they put together from the story, from the idea of things being otherworldly, from all the technical things that we we talked about the the way everything's presented it, it just they really built out a world that you're more than happy to be in from both its d- dystopia side and the matrix side um it's just again i'm ready to play right now matt are you telling the people of this age to watch the matrix i would take the red pill that's all i'm saying Matt is high on life. Bobby, (laughs) are you telling people to watch The Matrix? Absolutely. I loved it. Take the red pill. Do it. Everyone just wants to get high and lose themselves in the world, in the real world. (laughs) If you haven't seen it, please do watch it. You know, at this point, you've probably seen plenty of things that pull from all the ideas that came from this movie, um, but it really just still has that core identity to it that that makes it truly the matrix it is the one to watch um so yes please please watch this film as always thank you for listening and remember to to deny our own impulses is to deny the very thing that makes us human